Uh, well, I'm a private contractor now. Work for a defense contractor in uh, Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, actually, work with Jay Stratton, you know, who uh, was the director of the task force before he retired. And uh, while we're still doing very similar kind of work, we're doing it from a perspective of a of a defense contractor now instead of as government employees. So it's a little bit different. Um, we still talk to the same people. Uh, and we're still uh, very interested in the work and still doing similar kind of work. But um, as far as direct access to uh, or direct interaction with particular government individuals, I, I'll, I, I don't need to discuss that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One of the things that, uh, you know, people who are online are hypercritical, especially of anything to do with Skinwalker Ranch, and people pointed to your presence on that show and other shows as a way to kind of demean the broader scientific um, you know, caliber of the UAP task force and stuff like that. How do you answer that? I find that exceedingly humorous, actually, because uh, I actually have seen these people doing that, and uh, even even had seen some articles where they talk about my alleged uh, education. Well, it's all public knowledge. I mean, you can go to every university I say I went to, and you can find my transcript, you can get my diploma. Uh, you know, I did all these things. But the key here is that the UAP task force didn't. Uh, ask me, you know, the things I've seen is like, what's that ancient aliens guy is who they used. No, I started working for the DOD when I was 17. I earned a, a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, uh, a master's degree in physics, a master's degree in astronomy, a master's degree in aerospace engineering, a PhD in optical science engineering, and a PhD in aerospace engineering. And, uh, you know, I have 26 years of college. I have 35 years of experience doing classified uh, DOD type research where I've built spacecraft. I actually had a spacecraft on uh, the space station for, uh, I mean, a space experiment on there for two and a half years that discovered things about GPS we didn't know about. Uh, you know, I've done uh, defense oriented work. I've got, you know, seven patents that are defense oriented. Uh, I've built laser weapon systems. I've done all these types of things and worked for the intelligence community and NASA for so much time. That's, that's the person the UAP task force asked to be the chief scientist of. You know, I had the security clearances, I had the experience, I had the education. Uh, and the fact that I was on Ancient Aliens or on Skinwalker Ranch, that uh, is really only parallel. And for people to try and say something about it being uh, a discredit, well, it just shows how ignorant the people who say those things are. Uh, it's like a scientist saying, oh, we shouldn't study that topic because it's a fringe topic. There's no such thing as a fringe topic. If it's an unknown, then science requires you use the scientific method and investigate it. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, I'm, I'm a little annoyed as well as uh, I'm, I'm, it's humorous to me what, that how people are, are trying to discredit the, uh, the work that the UAP task force did. Uh, and it, there's even uh, there seems to be a lot of that going around. That, I mean, you talked about Stephen Greenstreet and John Greenwald. A lot of these guys are like professional skeptics who um, are. It seems like an organized effort. To, well, I have to to, to be honest. I got to be fair to Greenwald because well, he's he been fair to me. He's yeah, been yeah. fair to me. Okay. Uh, Greenwald is. Uh, he actually even debunked some of Greenstreet's uh, comments about me, showing my actual degrees and stuff, and yeah. and that that basically what I just said about that's why the government had hired me. So uh, while I may or may not disagree with some of the things Greenwald says, uh, uh, I, I think he's been fair to me, so I'm going to be fair to him. Sure, right? absolutely. But I mean, do you think that that is an organized effort? I mean, is there, a, you, you know, mentioned that the, and the thing, people getting paid, I mean, what do you think about that? I, you that know, I, I got to tell you, uh, what is driving these just hardcore, crazy skeptics, and I don't mean scientific skepticism. You, you have to have scientific uh, skepticism and you can't have cancel culture of the scientists that are skeptical, right? Or, or that are, are non-skeptical mm -hmm. uh, because that's the scientific method. Everybody's got a, uh, one individual will make a mistake in the math somewhere. You know, somebody always makes mistakes, but that's why you publish the work so people can find those mistakes and, and, and we can move forward and correct it and get it better and better and better. Yeah. But simply to start out from the beginning saying there's no such thing as UFOs, no such thing as uh, aliens, no such thing as any unusual events. They're all drones, balloons, and swamp gas. To start out with that, that's not scientific at all. Yeah. That's just saying for some reason that it can't be uh, uh, UFOs or whatever. And, and what's driving that? Is there a, uh, 
a cultural stigma that or a religious stigma? Is there or is there a a group of people that are somehow invested in there not being true scientific rigor to this problem? I don't know the answer to it, but man, it sure does seem like some of these guys, uh, like Green Street, for example, have have a motivation that's more than just a personal motivation. It's almost well, that's like there's an economic motivation. It's like, I mean, for most of these people, they're into this topic because they find it interesting or fascinating, and they pursue it, and they're willing to entertain various other theories and pursue it intellectually, honestly. And it seems like guys like Green Street, they've got an adopted point of view, and that's the one that they want to stick with. Um, I don't want him to dominate our conversation, but I, I have similar feelings to what he does as a journalist. Yeah, and, and, and it's not just him. I mean, there's a, there's a several there's several of them. Um, yeah. um, you know, there's a, what's his name, Michael... Uh, start, uh, Huntington uh, or... Uh, no, Sh Shermer? Yeah, I, uh, think, no. I think Shermer, okay. the, he's a skeptical guy. And, uh, and, it's, and in fact, I went uh, kind of head-to-head -head with him in a, in a, a UFO uh, online thing that uh, Ryan Graves put together. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, they, they, there, there are a lot of things that uh, we take for granted, for example, or we take just because a scientist said it that it's true. Like, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, the Fermi paradox that you've, I'm sure you, your, your uh, viewers, listeners have heard of sure. uh, is that uh, this famous uh, nuclear physicist from the Manhattan Project, Enrico Fermi, uh, made a comment that, well, there can't be any aliens because... A population growth model is such that by now they would have overpopulated the universe and we would all be just the one species. Mm -hmm. Well, this was done in the 1940s when he said that. And it's become the debunker's go-to tool. Yeah. Well, Fermi's paradox was actually Fermi's blunder. Because in 1914, uh, Lanchester took all of the predator-prey models known to biologists, which was not the exponential growth model that uh, Enrico Fermi used. It's the uh, uh, models that uh, it's called the Lotka Volterra model. There's other models called a predator prey model. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he used those. He was uh, given a contract from the war uh, uh, department to develop mathematical models of warfare. And he studied coyotes eating rabbits and rabbit uh, populations and so on for years and put together the actual known uh, models that predict like every species on the planet. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the math works. Yeah. This Nobel laureate physicist apparently had never read something that happened you know, 40 years or 30 years before that and, uh, and didn't bother to do his homework, didn't follow the scientific method. He didn't do his homework first. Mm -hmm. and, and just because he's famous, people believe what he said. Yeah. And it's the same thing as Carl Sagan and the nuclear winter thing. It, it turned out that you know, nuclear winter is a big... Uh, the math doesn't work out. Yeah, yeah. There's not a bomb on the planet large enough ever built by humanity that can throw enough dust up higher than the weather layers of the atmosphere so that it would create this nuclear winter. Yeah. The weather would clear it. It's been shown. Weather would clear out uh, the nuclear winter within weeks to a month or so. Wow. So, uh, you know, it's, because, it's the famous science syndrome. Yeah, famous yeah. Famous exactly. scientist syndrome. Yeah, yeah. Right? You know. Well, I mean, I've heard of it called, called scientism. Yes, where absolutely. It's, it's like there's a relig religiosity to it uh, where they have their articles of faith that they put their faith in, and then there's anything that's outside that. It's often called fringe or, or something. Yeah, rather than, rather than doing the math, mm -hmm. you just believe it. perfect example is uh, the story of Huxley's monkeys. Mm -hmm. A lot of people probably heard this. Huxley was trying to show that, uh, of course, evolution could be a real thing, right? And I'm not saying it is or isn't. I'm just saying this was his argument. Mm -hmm. And he said, so you could take a room full of monkeys and typewriters, and given enough time, they would write all the works of, they could hit the keys in the right order, that it would write all the works of Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Well, it just sounds like, oh, that sounds logical. Yeah, it just sounds logical, right? You think, okay, mm -hmm. I could believe that, given enough time. Mm -hmm. And the idea was, given enough time, the age of the universe, clearly the, the things would fall in line right to create sentient life. You know, mm -hmm. the, the genetic genome, all that put together, and then you would get the evolution and so on. Yeah. Well, but one of the things I have my, any students that come work for me do on the first day, I actually have them two, do two problems. One is I have them calculate how much energy it takes to uh, take power from a power plant over the power lines to charge an electric vehicle versus how much energy it takes just to put gas in a car and run a car. And you'll be surprised at the difference. Yeah. Uh, but the other problem is take Huxley's to monkeys and let's throw the monkeys and the typewriters out because we now have modern computers and use a room full of modern computers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, regular laptops or desktop, 
and let them randomly choose uh, characters and see how long it would take to write all of Shakespeare's works. Well, let's make it simple. If you put all Shakespeare's work in one book, it'd probably be about 100,000 words. So now go do that. Yeah. And I have them do the calculation. Yeah. And it turns out the fastest computers we have couldn't do it in thousands of times longer than the universe has been in existence. Yeah. So it's scientism to just take Huxley's monkey's argument for its word. Yeah, yeah. It's it's scientific method to actually do your homework, do the math, and see if it's true or not. Yeah. I mean, it's a platitude, and it's like the acceptance of platitudes is anti-science. Yes. You know, I mean, basically, um, yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that's been happening is the congressional uh, committees are gearing up, and especially in the Senate, I yep. guess, with uh, Gillibrand and the new uh, authorization, the Defense Authorization. The National Defense Authorization Act, yes. Yeah, where they want to encourage whistleblowers yep. uh, to come forward. Have you, um, I mean, I know that you're limited about what you can talk about, but have you heard any whispering in the, uh, among the marbled halls of Congress or anywhere else where um, you know that people are going to be coming out and that they may be saying some interesting things? Well, so I can tell you why that's there, because I was uh, partly uh, responsible for uh, suggesting such language to particular uh, senators and congressmen. Uh, the idea is that if uh, someone was in, if there was a program, like mm -hmm. say there was a Roswell crash, yeah, and they had reversed it, yeah, whatever, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it would be a particular special access program or a particular caveat in a uh, sensitive compartmented information, uh, TSSCI. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and only a few people would have ever been read into that particular compartment and they would have signed a non-disclosure agreement to never reveal uh, that as long as they're, you know, they live basically, because mm -hmm. uh, those things have a 75 year cap or a 100 year cap on them, depending on the particular classification. And uh, they would have no one they could legally tell this to without violating that NDA, which could have, end them up in jail. Mm -hmm. And so when we talked to Congress about this, uh, both Jay Stratton and I have talked to Congress and uh, you know, other, other folks, not, not just me, I'm just saying I was one of the voices, uh, that, and then we all kind of had a unified uh, thought on this, is that mm -hmm. there needs to be a pathway that anyone who could come forward, if, they ha if there was a heritage UFO program that we don't know about, then they should have a, a, an avenue legally uh, to come forward and tell us what they know before they die, because they got to be old by now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and before all the information is gone that we can't do any verification or, or backup of it, without them having the threat of having to go to jail if they tell us. Mm -hmm. And so that's what that, that language in the NDAA is about. Yeah. And uh, the, I think the really the only real way that that'll happen is uh, to create a classification that's above everything that you can feed upwards into it, mm -hmm. but then the problem is only people would ever get to see that classification. Yeah, how does it come down? Would, would, yeah. be, uh, would be someone like, uh, well, the president could, could uh, declassify anything he wants. Yeah. You know, if he wanted to do that, uh, any president, he or she, whatever, whenever, could do that. Uh, and now the other piece that would be, uh, you would have to make that classification such that the HIPC, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, and the SISI, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, could actually see that mm -hmm. and let them be also you got to give someone classification authority. That's the person or persons who have the authority to declassify it. Yeah. So someone with some sense and oversight mm -hmm. needs that. Yeah. And I think this NDAA language is start on that. Yeah. Well, an interesting thing that just happened recently is the Navy came out and said that uh, any UAP videos that are remaining in its uh, possession are classified and that to release them would endanger the United States. Um, what do you think about... Uh, did Scott Bray say that? Uh, that was uh, an article I read. I didn't, I didn't uh, get the source I don't, of that. I don't, I'm going to have to... I'll have to verify that, that claim. Okay. Uh, because uh, that's actually... I, I helped write the, the security class guide for the UAP task force, yeah. and it is not what the uh, security classification guide says. Okay. That... Uh, no, in fact, many of the videos that the Navy got were not classified. They were just uh, treated as sensitive. Mm -hmm. uh, but mostly the reason they're classified mm -hmm. is because, uh, say, uh, if, a, if a, uh, an F-22 chased something, all the sensors on that thing are, are have are their special access programs. You know, the, the, some of the, we don't even know that some of those sensors exist. Yeah. And, and if you were to release the data of tracking a UFO or whatever uh, with one of these uh, particular sensors, then it would release the knowledge to our near peers sure. that that sensor exists and the capabilities of that sensor. Yeah, yeah. And so you can imagine if an F-35 uh, caught one, if a spy satellite saw something, if a, if a Navy radar system on an on a aircraft carrier, if uh, you, know, you, you pick the defense uh, component, it's likely a classified component. 
Yeah. And so it's very difficult to release that information. But there's like cell phone videos that people that pilots shot through well, the window. Well, no, no, those none of those are classified un unless they reveal something about the methodology of which it was taken. Like for example, the things taken inside the. Uh, well, you want to wait doing. on that or go through it? Uh, I think the mic will help go through it. Uh, okay. Well, like like the uh, uh, the cell phone video that they showed at the at the Hipsy meeting, you know, a few months ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we actually had to go through that uh, to make sure that the cell phone didn't capture parts of the cockpit that may have been showing something going on at the time that was classified. Yeah. And so you had to think you had to think about it from that perspective. Sure, it's a yeah. difficult problem. And yeah. here's the thing: we talk about well, the UAP task force had all this time; they could have done all that. Well, let me tell you. Each one of these sensors and pieces of data is a different classification. Yeah. And you can't take something that's classified XYZ and, and something that's classified QRS and put them in the same computer. And, and, no, no. And, and because you can't cross those classifications. They're not, well, this isn't qualified for that, and that's not qualified for this. Yeah. I just made up those num letters. Yeah, yeah, those yeah, aren't real classifications. Yeah. Uh, but my point is, it's extreme. We had the biggest time figuring out, well, how do we even store all this data of different classifications? And then how do you analyze it? Because you can't overlay it and get, because you know, when you have more data, you get a more resolved result, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, uh, but we couldn't do that because there was no mechanism yet. Yeah. And that's, we spent the first year of the, uh, when I was with the task force, uh, thinking about how in the world do we do that, just that alone. Yeah. And then the other piece that we thought of was, how do we uh, create a new culture where if you see something, you need to report it to us so that we can track it or whatever, instead of worrying about, oh, it's going to kill my career if I report seeing a UFO. Yeah. That had to change. We briefed so many admirals and generals and all that kind of stuff, telling them, look, if there's something flying over a test range, what happens if one of these days one of your F-22s or F-35s or F-18s flies into it and it destroys it and kills somebody, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, which is the exponential growing threat that they mentioned in the NDAA. It's like things are exploding because it's happening more and more, right? Yeah, either it's happening more and more, or it's what I call sensor bias. Mm. Uh, everybody's got a cell phone now. There's a camera on every street. Uh, there's instruments everywhere. Everybody's got uh, little spectrum analyzers. People are beginning to see them because now they have equipment that they can capture them with. Yeah. Before, and the stigma, especially since the government's come out and said that they're real, right? Uh, the stigma of, of saying you saw something isn't as big either. Yeah. So it could have always been around, and, uh, and it was sensor bias now and cultural bias. To yeah. keep it from being, uh, you know, prevalent. Yeah. Um, to get back to Skinwalker Ranch, I don't want to take too much more of your time, but uh, you uh, you said something interesting up, uh, when we were at the table chatting, and you were like, "Well, if I was Bigelow and I had found a UFO, I would have taken it back to my hangar and somewhere and such such." Now, watching the show the past few years, now I've only seen season three. I think you guys are choosing season four right now. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I've wondered is, did they find something in that, uh, you know, the Mesa? and then blow it up, and you guys are kind of just dealing with the trailings that are left over from, that was pulled out of there, and uh, I mean. Believe me, we've had that conversation, because okay. there is a spot that um, it looks like it was collapsed in, right? And, uh, but we don't know if it was a natural collapse or somebody blew it up or whatever, and we've had this conversation. We can't prove any of that, of course, yet, and, uh, but we're doing our best and our, uh, our diligence with uh, the equipment and resources we have to get to the bottom of that. And that's a really good uh, question, and uh, we, we have the same question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, what do you think is a, what do you see as the a successful culmination of this investigation from your perspective? Is it identifying the phenomenon, whatever the hell that is, excuse my language, or is it um, uh, just uh, figuring out which questions to ask? Where do you see this like coming down successfully? Well, if we were to identify what's causing all the weird phenomena, I mean, of course that would be a success, right? Sure. But uh, even if we don't identify the phenomena, but we get smarter at investigating the phenomena, we develop new sensors and protocols for investigating the phenomena, and we find just one little thing, one little thing that's new science or new physics, new engineering, uh, it might, that, that to me is a win. Like, what if it turns out, you know, these metal pieces that we pulled out of the Mesa, which are actually odd in their construction, by the way. Yeah, I saw, it, I saw the professor talk about what it if they, What if they turn out to be, and, and this is pure speculation, but what if they turned out to be something that uh, enables something like uh, faster-than-light travel or uh, uh, invisibility cloak or, or uh, propellantless propulsion or... Uh, or 
you know, free energy from the vacuum energy uh, fluctuations. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's pure speculation, and I'm not sure. saying that that's what it's going to turn out to be. But what if, what if, mm -hmm. you know, we find one little thing, even if it's just that? Think of the next level uh, knowledge and economy that that can can spark and generate. Yeah, it's like the high risk, high reward sort of. Yeah, it's I mean, absolutely like yeah. a DARPA program. Absolutely yeah. is. I mean, yeah. you're going to invest in th things that could potentially change the whole world. Well, that's uh, our hope, right? Yeah. Even if even if the potential change is we learn one new thing about the math or the science, mm -hmm. that's still something new that we didn't have before. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's pretty much all I had for you. I mean. Uh, how would you, basically, as a final question, how would you sum up your experience these last four years on Skinwalker, and how has it changed you as a, <laughs> a scientist and a person? Well, it, it's, it's really, uh, I don't know if humbled me is the right word, but what it's done is made me realize that you know, what I thought I knew wasn't near as much as, as what I actually know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm learning also that people have agendas that are outside of uh, getting to the actual truth. Yeah. And that's something that uh, you have to kind of work through. It's, it's like, a, it's like uh, rafting down white water uh, rapids and there's boulders sticking up everywhere and you don't know if it's a, that boulder's going to be a good one to stop by or not, right? And uh, so it's just, you know, making your way down this path and, and, and trying to do the best you can to uncover what in the world is going on. And in, in doing that, uh, it's made me much more open-minded. Uh, it's made me really, really, truly understand what the scientific method really means, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the, the skeptics can say whatever they want to, I don't care. Uh, the thing about that is, is I realize now that they do not understand the scientific method. Sure. And it also made me realize that I think uh, what, what changed humanity was the Renaissance. And I kind of blame the Renaissance for where we are now mm -hmm. in that we separated all things conscious and spiritual away from true uh, science because it became, and during the Renaissance, everything spiritual and metaphysical, you can't explain, it's over here, we don't talk about that as science and real. Mm -hmm. The only real things are mechanical cause and effects things that we can see, I drop a, a, a glass and it breaks on the floor. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we separated that. But your brain is your consciousness, is you, and there, there's processes, physical and chemical processes, quantum physics going on in your brain that creates your consciousness in some form or fashion. That's science. Yeah, absolutely. That's not metaphysics. That's yeah. not spirituality and woo-woo, but it is yeah. at the same time. Exactly. So you cannot separate those two. Yeah. And I blame the Renaissance for that as well as uh, we've just allowed that cultural stigma to continue to grow. And that the ranch has actually enlightened me to these things, I think, uh, yeah. in, in a way. Well, that's one of the things that uh, you hear about from people uh, who study this phenomenon is that maybe there's a convergence going on from the things that are consciousness-based or spiritual-based and science, and maybe that they'll come oh, back I think together. That's true. Yeah. Uh, I think you, there are Nobel Prize winning physicists like John Wheeler, uh, Ro uh, nominated folks like Roger Penrose, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, guys that are looking deeply into uh, consciousness, uh, you know, Gary Nolan, for example, yeah. uh, that are looking into how our consciousness works through quantum physics and uh, realizing that the spirituality consciousness piece of it might actually be a piece of modern physics if we would just uh, allow ourselves to study and investigate it properly. Yeah. You know, that's, that's all I have for you. But the, the interesting thing also is you mentioned the, the boulders going downstream and Gary Nolan and Elizondo and yourself. It's like every time someone comes up to say, well, I'm a, I'm a scientist and I'm authoritative and I'm looking at this critically, then the wolves converge on that person. I mean, Gary is just starting to get a little sense of that. You've gone through that. Elizondo went through that. And it makes you wonder why. I mean, I guess it just... Yeah, what's spiritual. driving that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly what, right. It's, what is driving, what is the motivation behind this group of people that want to viciously attack, debunk, and cancel? Yeah. Uh, is there a... A shadow group behind the curtain that's driving this, paying yeah. this, funding this, uh, putting the energy behind it. That seems like conspiracy theory stuff, but uh, you know, it's too orchestrated yeah, yeah, and it's, it's too much. Yeah, it's, it's so odd. And it happens so consistently. Yeah. With these guys. Now, and I'll tell you, I'm not a conspiracy uh, theory believer. In fact, uh, conspiracies are illegal uh, mm -hmm. in our constitution. Mm -hmm. So if uh, if we find 
you know, some shadow organization or some men in black or whatever, then they're breaking the law. Yeah, absolutely. And we need to find them and bring them to justice, yeah. I think. Well, and that may be part of the reason why they, you know, try to uh, destroy every effort to uncover it, because they know that over the past 70 years, they've done some things. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, that's right. I appreciate right. it, sir. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate it. Ah. Okay.